last week we were talking about those particular days and we're in the middle of a 40 day experience, a sun stand still devotional and we passed out over 190 books and God is moving like never before but when you see a video like that it really makes you stop in your tracks. I mean, what are we truly called to, to do as Christians, as, you know, people? I mean, what is it that, you know, I can tell you in my spiritual process, I would, you know, thought just going to church or being a good person was good enough. But it's not. And honestly, I can tell you from personal experience, the only way that I've been able to obtain personal fulfillment is for faith to be in action. That it's not, not, it's not just coming to church and the different things because you never know. And, and that's why this Take 5 initiative is, is so critical due to the fact that, you know, you, you know, I can tell you how I operate. I mean, if, if I don't have somebody talking to me about something, I become complacent. But if I got this on my wrist, the Take 5, it, it'll remind me that I just had an opportunity to show the love of God. Otherwise, life just passes you by. And it's like coming to church, you mean, activate something within us, being around people to be sharpened and be part of the body of Christ to really join together for the common good, for the people that are hopeless to bring hope in. And that's what's so powerful about this particular body. If we analyze the last 25 days in this devotional, for those of you who are uh, guests and that we are going through a 40-day experience. And like we say every week, I mean, you don't want your book to, you know, sound like a, a door creaking, you know. I mean, if, if that's the case, I mean, I don't want to have to dust my Bible off the shelf. But for the majority of my life, my Bible was on the shelf. And the very thing that I tried to serve, you know, I wondered why I, I was held captive to many different things. But if we do a quick recap of the first 20 some days, I mean, the prayer that stopped the sun, your 20. Page 23 vision was day two. Ignite the ordinary. God is wants your extras. See, I mean, look at look at that video. I mean, uh, somebody that was neat just wanted somebody's extras. As we talked about last week, I mean, faith without works is dead. That, that if you're under the sound of my voice, if you're in a line of 100 people represented on this planet, you're in the front of the line if you live in the United States. You're in the front of the line. I was watching another video today. My wife was showing me that they, you know, you know how this world is changing and different things. But but I have the audacity to look at the things that I don't have versus the things I have. And I, I, I want to be very sensitive to that. So we talked about ignite the ordinary. What is your vision worth to you? One thing I heard in church this morning is if you, you know, your provision, your personal goals, your personal visions are, are your provision is part of this vision, being connected to the body of Christ. As you're reading this book, you're, you're, if you don't have the maturity like I haven't had the majority of my life, I'm like, well, God wants me to do this to glorify Him. Well, what about me? I'm going to church because I need to get better. I'm going to church because I'm tired of being anxious and angry. But if you're reading the book and you know the Word of God that He performs a healing for one reason and one reason only, so He can be glorified. So it don't matter how dark your dark is, if you allow Him, if you, you allow Him to work with you. See, one thing I've learned that God doesn't work for me, He works with me and He needs my participation. Faith without works is dead. I want to be right in the middle of a move of God. I don't want, I can't expect a mainline blessing with a sideline commitment as I sit and wonder why I'm the victim in my life and why all this stuff is happening. Well, God has brought me here now to get victory. Amen. So I can teach other people that have been just like me. Yeah. That thought faith was coming to church on Sunday and just to get me to church on Sunday was a miracle. See, and it's about to be extraordinary. God wants to do extraordinary things in our life. You know, seize the vision. Give me my rocks. you got to be you. you got to be real. God is bigger than your mountain, perhaps paradox. you got to learn how to, you know, really operate within the doubt of different things. Day 10 says, between the promise and the payoff. Why is it that we always quit right before we get the blessing? 
Mistakes in America. Well, this church was birthed on mistakes. See, it says, expect the best. Don't wait for the other shoe to drop. I lived the majority of my life with that impending doom of waiting for the other shoe to drop. With God, it never drops. He's holding the shoe up. See, the key is, as we, we dare to spontaneous obedience, day 13, day 14, whose idea was that? And then, and then we went through on a Tuesday, and I, I like Tuesdays because it gets a little more intimate, but we talk about hear the word, speak the word, do the word, march all night, and, and the, the different things that, that, that this book has been teaching us. But I mean, what I thought about as we were doing praise and worship is one of the days, one of the chapters of this devotional is God likes to use nobodies. Let me take it a step further. What he's doing here. He's using the lowest of the low. And I qualify as that. Because I'm not going to let my past dictate my future. Amen. See, he uses nobodies. But what but, but that's referencing is that, that, you know, just people, what about the people that really screwed up their lives? to show off. He, he likes to really begin to do that. And, and if you're truly, you know, going in and making this the best it can possibly be to understand that your provision is within this vision. Now in day 25 it says, connect her to the current. And it says in Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, as a prisoner for the Lord. See, I've been a prisoner to other things. Prisoner to my anger. Prisoner to my confusion. Prisoner to my resentment, prisoner to my past, but, but being a prisoner of the Lord, I mean, you know, being in that self-made prison between my two years where I can't even it, comprehend my future, let alone enjoy my present, because I'm a prisoner to my past, that I came to realize that, that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. I mean, you've got to know what the Word of God says. That when I read Romans 7, 15 through 17, that I didn't like what I was doing, and I hated what I was doing, but it made sense. God knew exactly what I was doing. The devil trained me good, and I'm a warrior for him. Amen. So the rest of your life can be the best of your life. But you've got to be getting connected to the current. Amen. You've got to sever your connections to other things. Yeah. Even to your own understanding. Because when you're operating in the carnal mind, you're never going to have freedom. See, so you need to be, it says, connect her to the current. See, it's like we as people get connected to this, we get connected to that. And, you, know, you know, you saw it last week as I was sitting here weeping. It's like something was falling off of me. And, and, and you ignited that through your generosity to our Katie team. I really done a lot of soul searching. God, why did you do that to me at that particular time? You know, I, I, I receive it, but when you guys, I mean, Morgan said it, you know, it was like Jesus turned it the lows. Jen prayed that this, this afternoon in the circle. But it's saying, as a prisoner of Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. What have we learned about the calling that God has in our life? That it's a gift. And if you treat your calling like a gift, you'll operate effectively within the parameters of your call. And you've got to understand that many are called and few are chosen. The Bible says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. See, that we don't want to be an ineffective, unproductive church. We want to possess these qualities in increasing measure, as the Word of God says, so we're not going to be ineffective and unproductive. Then I don't have to fall and stumble anymore. And if I do, as Carissa said, I get back up quickly and keep moving. Sometimes stumbling in life is part of the process. Yeah. It's just one more mess that God can turn into a message. But what it's saying here now is, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling. So, was I worth saving? That's what I have to ask myself. Was I worth saving? See, the answer to that question is, how am I living? Am I living worthy to the calling that you receive? Be completely humble. See, if you want to continue to be exalted in the kingdom and in life, you've got to stay low and stay humble, and He will exalt you. No matter how high He exalts you, you still have to practice humility, understanding the only reason you are where you're at is because of Him. Amen. And He gets the glory. Yeah, but, I mean, but, but, but people come to me and say, well, what about me? What about my family? What about my finances? Well, then you've got to understand that if you get out of your own way and you humble yourself, you become a warrior, you're worthy of the call, you recognize that God chose the foolish thing, so quit worrying about all your mistakes. Understand that you're powerful and wise, and God 
cloud of witnesses. Look around the room. I could go pew by pew by pew and tell you about miracles. See, it's understanding. Am I worthy? Yeah, there's a different energy in here tonight. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing one another in love. That means you're going to have to bear some things. But completely humble. It says, make every effort to keep the unity. So it's one thing to have the unity in the congregation. It's another thing to keep it. It's one thing to give peace and purpose. It's another thing to keep it. So that word keep it, make every effort. That means we've got to work for this. To keep the unity of the spirits and the bond of peace. I mean, I, I love me. And, and now check this out now. There's some use. Listen to the word one. There is one body, one spirit. Just as you were called again to one hope. When you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. It's the ultimate authority in your life. So I ask myself the question, I mean, so, I mean, a lot of us have an issue with authority. And, and, and then I read this next one in verse 7, it says, But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So Christ distributes grace. Well, I was one of those EGR guys, extra grace required. <laughs> he had distributed grace upon grace upon grace upon grace to get me to where I am today. And I think you qualify as that, too. I'm an EGR kid. I need it, and still do to this day. Extra grace required. And he, he, he distributes it. So, so well, check this out now. You've got to understand how God works. Verse 11, so Christ himself gave the apostles. See, God gives you people. How are you treating these gifts? Gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. Why does God give us those people? Are we treating them as a gift? And, 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 and as I meditated thoroughly on these mess, these three days, these three or four days, is the fact that, that God is a, is, is a God of order. There are certain ways that He operates, and there are certain ways that He expects us to operate. There are parameters to what it is He's calling us to do. And this is one of them. That, that, that God gives you people, and you better know who your Moses are, your Joshua's are. And it says, why does God give us these people? The first reason what he does, to equip his people for works of service. Amen. Where do you find opportunity of service? Through your church. See, there's going to be no shortage of opportunity here. So that the body of Christ may be built up. So he, he gives us these people for work, so to equip us for works of service so we may be built up, the second thing. The third thing is until we reach unity in the faith. So we've got to learn unity. I don't think we came here because we had a lot of unity. And you've heard me say this on Tuesdays for many years. My relationships were screwed up because I was in them. So I had to learn unity and, 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 and be taught these things. And it says, in the knowledge of the Son of God, see, the, 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 the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, that's their role. To teach knowledge of the Son of God so we can become mature. So you, you don't have to worry anymore, well, God's going to do this so He can be glorified? What about me? Then you need to know Matthew 6.33. For every this, there's a that. But if you only know that this without that, you'll be confused. You've got to understand that if you put him first, Amen. he's got all your needs covered. Amen. And once he gets more of you and you surrender more to him, your needs are going to change. And your wants definitely will too. Because we're so into ourselves. And we want to be connected to the right. And now it goes on to say, then, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth. Are you tired of being toxic, tossed back and forth like infants, depending on how you feel? You're learning to be a principal person. It takes time and it's a process. But now it says to the leaders, instead of speaking the truth in love. I, I've been in ministry for 10 years, catering to people like me suffering from addiction. They only respond to one thing, love. That's it. When you speak the truth in love, it's effective. Amen. You can't speak the truth without love, it won't be effective, even though it's the truth. Right. People respond.
respond to love because God is love and God is patient, He is kind, He does not envy, He does not boast. People respond to love. But if you know Hebrews 12, now God disciplines those He loves. So a lot of us get a misunderstanding of why you, why, I mean, why are you cutting me? Why are you coming after me? Why are you challenging me? Because you need to grow up in God. You need to be thoroughly equipped for service. You need to be built up. See, I got an awesome message from Augie this week. God always uses people. Thinking for Tuesdays and what this church is doing, and not you know, in his life, but every and in other people's life. I mean, God is just working. I mean, He put that on Augie's heart to send me at a time that I really needed to hear it. Because I'm a human too. And, 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 and the key is that we need to be connected to the current. And in day 25, I, mean, I don't want, instead of speaking the truth of we will grow to become in every respect a mature body. Who, see, so we need to be connected to, from Him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself in love. Each part does its own work. So what, what we do together is so important now. And, and what it's saying in day 25 is, is so important, is what are you connected to? If you want to open your books. See, I was connected to my job. That was my identity. I was connected to things that weren't so good. I was connected to shame, connected to anger. But, but it's saying now, connect her to the current. To say someone is called to full-time ministry suggests others are permitted to do part-time ministry. There's no such thing as part-time Christian. Boy, I, I, I thought there was. I was a Christian in this area, but not in that area. I was a Christian on Sundays, but not on Friday nights. See, that's why a lot of us don't like to come to church. Because our parents were a Christian in church, but they weren't any other day of the week. But that's just an excuse. That's like as Carissa said, it's that they just did the, you know, this, this church is real, so you, you can't use that as an excuse anymore. <laughs> As a cop out. I mean, it, it's so important to understand. And, and, and now it goes on to say on page 78, and whatever you, wherever you work, that's your ministry. I mean, I watched Denise down at where she works, and she's got a huge responsibility. It's, it's a ministry. I mean, what she, how she operates and represents and talks, it impacts people. And anything any of us do is a ministry. Whoever you can, wherever you go after church tonight, whoever you run into the aisle in the store is your ministry. See, I mean, and that's my job as a pastor is to equip and, and to challenge and can't you ask, can't you find me? How can I buy? I love the different things that they do there. But I mean, also, I mean, it's not always, but wherever you are, that's your ministry. Whatever you're good at, that's your calling. In this way, very component of your assignment will be in deep significance. The only way that I've found fulfillment in my life is to answer the call on my life, which is ever-changing. Ten years ago, it was just helping people. Six guys in a house. I, I don't even know if my call is to be a pastor of a church, to be honest with you. I just seized the vision. You know, and, and we're not going to be those type of people. I mean, I just do what my Joshua says to do. And it, it obviously it aligns with the Word of God and the vision of God for my life. And everything else is taken care of through provision. We don't have any needs. Life is not easy. But everything God says we can have, we can have. See, I mean, I, mean, I think so many Christians or people are general. Where's my purpose? What's my calling? And we don't do what's in front of us. See, and it says a sun stands still assignment might not be mediatic, meteoric. <laughs> it, it might be mundane. Well, yeah, it was ten years ago. And it maybe still is today for me. But when you give what you've got to a cause of the one who gave it to you in the first place, the effects of your investment will literally reach the heavens. Ask God to help you see the opportunities and represent Him in your everyday life. So when people experience you, what do they experience? See, one thing that I'm very cautious of, and I'm not perfect in this area, the way people see me operate during the week, would they want to come to my church? Our church. Now I'm a 
pastor of the church. See, it's so important to, to, to say that your profession is their pulpit. They are an image of God within the sphere of their influence. If God can trust you with the influence that's in front of you, He will continue to increase your area of influence in every area, not just your ministry, which should be your job anyway, no matter who your employer is. It's still your ministry. The Bible says, work as it as you're working unto the Lord, not for men. There should be something different about you at the office. I don't want to be one of those conformers anymore. I'm going to conform to this gossip talk. And see, people don't bring stuff around me. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying it's always been that like that too. Now it's saying day 26, confident humility. And this is a very, very timely word. And it says in Matthew 8, 55 through 13, it says an army officer came to him begging for help. The officer said, Lord, my servant is home in bed. He can't move his body. And he has a... See, why is it that people always come to Jesus of the church for help? Even if they don't believe they come. See, I got a call this week and from this friend of mine that's been years that, you know, he came through the program many years ago and got his own business and everything else and kind of just like I drifted away. And, and now he needs help and he expects me to drop everything. And I often think about Jesus. We expect him to drop everything. And he does it. And that's how good he is. And that's what he did here in this story. He said, I got, you know, this guy's name, but there are some things that spoke to me. I've, I've, I've taught on this passage before that spoke to me at a different level here. It says, Jesus said to the author, I will go and heal him. The officer answered, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come to my house. See, do we really understand the level of anointing of whoever it is that God has placed in your life to get your healing? Do you take for granted for what's in front of you? See, when my pastor comes around, I, I, I pay respects to him. You know, we, we went and laid hands on Candace. I know how valuable his time is for him to do that. And, and that's what this, this soldier is saying. He knows that Jesus' time is valuable. And he says, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. You need to command it. To, but then he's got confidence and humility. But check this out. Now, here's, if you want God to operate in your life in the way that he is capable of operating, there are certain principles we've got to follow. I, too, am a, you know, first and foremost, God doesn't have to do any of this stuff that he's done for me. He does it because he's God and he's loved. And I kind of come to the realization that the majority of the people that have helped me get to where I am today didn't have to do that. They did it out of the kindness of their heart, but this, this particular person understands that. Hey, I know how powerful you are, Jesus. Just heal them. You're not, you're not, I'm not worthy to come out and says, I too am a man under authority. So now, look at the authority change. You've got to be under authority. A man under authority. I have soldiers under my command. So he's saying, I'm under somebody's authority. There's people under my authority. He understands the authority of Jesus. And he says, and, and then he goes, I tell you one, tell one soldier, go and he goes. I tell another soldier, come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. He says, to those who are following him, I tell you the truth, this is the greatest faith I have found even in Israel. That somebody actually is obedient and understands the authority that they're under. Amen. That impressed Jesus. And it says, go home, servant, and be healed, just as you believed he would, and his servant was healed. So I, I want you to understand that God puts people in your life to equip you, to, to build you up so you can be mature, that you can learn unity, that you can know how to serve others, that we need to understand authority. No matter how big this program gets and how big this church gets, I will always be under the authority of my pastor. And I hate authority. But that's why we are where we are. That's why that guy just got healed. See, I mean, that's how God works. Joshua took his team. See, 
and, 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 and told them when to go and when to stop and do this. I mean, I've had to do that for many years and will continue to do it. The day that I stop doing that, we're in trouble. This church will be gone. See, you know, and it's very difficult. And that's where it, I love it when God takes people that absolutely despise authority because of childhood issues, takes the nobodies like me and turns them into a somebody for him. And he says, well, yeah, I know he's got an issue with authority, but that don't matter to me. He's got to play by my rules now. Ooh, that made me cringe. But those rules gave me everything. See, I don't even look at them as rules. You hear me say this. This is not a book of rules. This is a bag of seeds to fulfill your needs. And every need you have is in this book. Amen. See, we, we've got to understand that how God works is, you know, being confident in humility. And that's what it's saying here, confident in humility. Praying audacious prayers and walking bold in faith obviously take confidence. But healthy confidence is born with genuine humility. The two must work in tandem. Confidence without humility is arrogance. Humility without confidence is timidity. Confidence and humility are both biblical and they're equally essential for the life of faith. Jesus offers to abort his scheduled ministry. When God calls you to do something, it doesn't matter about your plans. Jesus even had to change his schedule. Let me tell you, he changed his schedule many times for me. The board he scheduled ministry activities to make a house call and heal the servant. But the commander suggests an alternative. Now this is the man who says, I'm under authority, there's people that are under my authority, and I respect your authority. I respect your authority to the level that I know you can heal my servant. And that servant must be pretty valuable to him, and he must respect his servant because he says, the guy does whatever it needs to be done. And that's why he's going to get his healing, because he's within the parameters of how God works. You can't expect a healing unless you're within the parameters of how God works. See, uh, the, the nine, nine went and got healed, but one turned around and said, thank you, Jesus, and he became whole. Didn't forget where he got his healing. Amen. See, I mean, be, get around something that can really excite and ignite the Word of God in your life. So it's living and active. It's just not... Why does he keep referencing a bag of seeds to fulfill his needs? I don't even know what that means. <laughs> These are basic instructions before leaving earth. <laughs> and how you leave earth will matter with these basic instructions the closer you get to leaving earth. See, it's so important that you understand here it says that the textbook lesson in audacious faith bolstered a confident humility. Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Humility. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. Confidence. Complete confidence in com competency of Christ matched with, with sincere humility about oneself. This is the only formula for authentic audacious. See, I I'm not worthy. To be called a pastor. To, to be part of a family. He's worthy. He's being glorified. See, I, I, didn't, I, didn't get a, I didn't come here with a bunch of gold stars. He is the star. Amen. He's the one that, 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 that I've got to understand and, and all of us. And, and that's keeping humble. It says, don't be like so many Christians who never wade in deep waters and fear stingrays, sharks, and undertows. The one who creates, commands, and calms the waves is also able to keep you from going under. Thank God for him. At the same time, don't get overconfident in your own abilities to do something great for God. You'll end up thrashing around in self-reliance rather than clinging to God. But we're clinging to God more than ever before right now. We are in deep waters. We don't have a clue what we're doing. Not a clue. That's a perfect place to be. It's a perfect place to be. It says, as Jesus taught, you are, when you've done everything you were told to do, you should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done out of duty. It says, side of having too much confidence in yourself or on the side of having too little confidence in Him. So, I mean, what is it that, that we're learning here? Now it's saying in day 27, prayer like a juggernaut. I think it's, is that what it's called? <laughs> Again, I'm not the sharpest tool in the set. If God can use me, He can use anybody. 1 John 5, 1 through 15, 
Now, this has got some heavy revelation. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. So by believing, you become a child of God. Yeah. But now check this out. Verse 2. We know we love God's children if we love God and obey His commandments. So now there's a condition for love. Obedience. It says, loving God means keeping His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. It's not a book of rules. It, it, oh, I mean, well, you want to talk Old Testament commandments, oh, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt make, oh, that's just too much for me. Thou shalt not steal, you know, the, the commit adultery. But, but I'm talking about some New Testament stuff. Like it's so burdened. I mean, it's an awesome privilege. and Because when, when you put God first, that stuff ain't even appealing anymore. When fear comes in, I don't even, fear you have no place here. Because perfect love drives out fear. Amen. What's perfect love? God. Yeah. See, you, you want to be thoroughly equipped for every good work, but it says loving God means keeping His commandments, and His commandments are not our purpose. So if you don't understand the love of God, and you don't believe you're a child of God, what, what, what ignited for me before I even could understand is just be obedient and be a doer, and then I learned how to be a love of God, and I've learned to love myself, and in turn learned to love others, Including, I could never for the wildest dreams, why I couldn't even love people that I loved. Wasn't that something? I couldn't even love my kids and I loved them. Couldn't love my wife and I loved her. My parents and I loved them. See, I needed to experience the love of God. And, and, and getting out of my own way. And, and, and it's so important that we grasp this now. And it says, for every child of God defeats... Now check this out. Verse 4. For every child of God defeats this evil world. So now, how do you defeat your past, your present, and your future, your thoughts, your emotions, and your will? It tells us that for every child of God defeats the evil world. Now, are you a child of God? It says, yes, you are, by believing. But it's also saying you will know God's love through obeying His commandments. That means keeping His commandments and in those things. And they're not supposed to be designed to, to hurt or punish you or make you have to live out. I can still live outside of the box. I will never get close to living inside the box. I walk a narrow road. God designed me to live outside the box. I'm crazy. <laughs> I'm on fire for him. I'm on fire for some other things too. But I mean, I mean, I'm not going to stop being me. Then that would be a disservice. But now it's saying now this prayer, and it says now on day 27, it says, "Has your prayer life been changing as you've been working your way through the sun standstill devotion?" I hope you're beginning to pray with more boldness and more faith, even if your progress seems small. Let's and subtle so far. Let's welcome Brandon. Come up here. You. See, I got a little victory testimony on his prayer life this week. Orange bike. I grab that one. You know more about the mics than I do. You know nothing, so I. <laughs> Tell us about your prayer this week.
So the only other option was her going back to a rest home, which we fought for four years to get her out of. Um, every time there was any hope of getting her moved up here, it would just get ripped away. I just, I got to the point I was just ready to give up. I was actually planning on putting my last two paychecks away and going back to Ohio. And I woke up one morning, read the Sun Stand Still devotional of this chapter, and decided that I needed to pray. And I thought about Monica how she talks about praying on her knees. So I got down on my knees and signed my bed. And I prayed like I never prayed before. And, um, I, I told God that I needed a Joshua woman and I needed him to make the sun stand still for me. And later that night, I talked to Scott. That's a good advice for him. Scott prayed for me. And then the next day, Tuesday night, I was out in the parking lot at break time and I got a <coughs> that something was going to come through. So we got some money coming and I'm going to be able to get my mom moved up there. Deaths, uncertainty, and if we had time, he'd get into the, the struggle they had with his mother down there. He's all she's got left. Amen. And God brought him up here to get right. So now he can be that son. Amen. Let's give God the glory. Amen. Please come up. It's saying, you know, and there's testimonies like that all around. It's wrapped up with urgency. It's filled with possibility. Most of us, a whole new way to pray. You know, but some of us have, know what it's like to pray in certain times of our lives, a very serious prayer. So what if we learn to be that serious about prayer all the time? See, one thing I think that we're, we, 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 we don't think our prayers are heard because, number one, you know, we, we don't know authority, we don't know this, we, we've done so many things in our past, we don't even know if we believe God, but I'm here to tell you, your prayers are answered if you're under the sound of my voice, no matter what your belief system is, somebody prayed for you to get here if it wasn't you yourself. And prayers are very powerful and effective and insane. I call it by praying. And it says the judgment is defined as a large, overpowering, crushing force of motion. See, my mom prayed for me. That's why I'm here. And it says, notice it, it, what it doesn't say is we ask. This is very important. If we ask anything we desire, it doesn't say that. Or if we ask anything a day sleep, but if we ask according to his will. Now you gotta understand. If you're asking for something and you don't get it because it's not going to be good for you, God knows better than you do. So this is where a lot of people, due to lack of maturity, including me along the way, didn't understand this. In other words, God wants our agenda to align with His will. Our audacity must be in sync with God's purposes. Praying this way reconciles your dreams with God's actually finding the Bible. At some time, it will infinitely expand the scope of your hope. When it comes to standing on God's purposes and promises, why shouldn't we push the limits and aggressively pursue new territory? That's what's happening right now in this church. Prayer in the arena where our faith meets God's abilities. And there is never going to be a moment when audacity of our faith surpasses God's capacity to respond. That's why timid prayers are a waste of time. And they are a misappropriation of the authority as believers in Christ. It may take some adjustment to get in a place where extraordinary prayers become ordinary in our lives. It may require that the flex of muscles we didn't know we had. But the Bible leaves us without excuse. We're strong in the Lord and it's time to put those muscles to work. What, in what area is God calling you to do something big? Pray about it today. 
See, it says in 828, build your case. See, today I can stand in, in, in front of God and under somebody else's authority and the ultimate authority. Doing the best job I possibly can, can when it comes to obedience and sacrifice. God wants your time, your talent, your time. And I can build my case and so can you in front of Him. See, when you start praying scriptures, you're coming in agreement to what it is. I said a powerful prayer for somebody in church this morning and I felt the Holy Spirit heavy because I was praying scriptures over him. Praying promises. Joshua's bold request was based on a promise that God had made. In each of these scenarios, one of God's servants is reminding God of something he did. See, you got you know, it's not that God forgot, but be bold and say, God, just like you took care of this, I need to take care of that. And whatever requirements you have of me, I'm willing to do it. And it says, a promise he made concerning the future. What's the reason for this? Did God forget? Does he need an administrative assistant? Reminding God of his promises isn't about giving him new information. It's about experiencing transformation. So whenever I get in a pinch because of life on life's terms, I remind God, God, you told me that everything works together for the good for those who love you and have been called according to your purpose. God, you know I love you. I know you love me. And for the best of my abilities, I think I'm walking on my purpose. That's transformation. See, when things get a little ugly and, you know, the world um, is falling apart, I say to God, I say, God, you said to me that I need to be confident of this very thing, that once you start something, you're going to finish it. Yeah. <laughs> when the, my finances fall apart and I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills and i got more things and, and I've done my tie, it's hell and tie, i got to say to God, God, in Luke 6.38, you say... Measure I use will be measured to me. See, it's like, you know, that's transformation. You're, you're in sync with God. By going back to the Word of God, it says, and recalling His promises and the pattern of His actions. I mean, God, you did this. Why am I tripping, man? This ain't nothing like that was. This mountain ain't even quite anywhere near the size of that one that you triumphed over through me. See, well, you know, it's not, it's not so much about reminding God, it's reminding yourself. See, we need those subtle reminders, and, and, and that's why God puts Joshua's and Moses in our life. So when we become terrified and afraid, it says now, by going back to the Word of God, it says, and it says, His promises and patterns of His actions in the past, your boldness is stirred, your desires are aligned with God's purposes. The promises of God are integrated in the fabric of your faith. And you're, you know, God doesn't want you to talk to Him, you know, obviously out of respect, but be bold. I assure you, however, that building the case before God is biblical. It's not, it's practical. I've seen and transformed the prayer lives of thousands of Christians who are tired of praying to God about the same old things in the same old way. By building a case before God, you can approach Him with audacious faith because your prayer is based on a solid foundation, which is the Word of God. God, would you multiply that same kind of provision for my family right now? So, I mean, you know, here it is. I heard Margaret talk about it. Jen prayed about it. We must need to talk about it because everybody else is talking about it. Now it's on page 88 of the book. It says, Lord, I'm low on resources. One time I read in Matthew 14 how you fed over 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. God, would you multiply that same kind of provision in my family right now? Now, if you're operating within the parameters of His principles, with His love all over you, He will do that. In fact, even if you aren't, He does it sometimes. Because He's trying to get your attention that He's real. Even if you didn't really believe me, and I still perform the miracle in your life. Why you doubt me now? See, it says it's remarkable to realize that you can pray this way about anything, healing, the salvation of love, reconciliation within torn apart families, depression, children who have wandered, whatever you're dealing with at any time. You can pray like this about any area where you believe in God for the impossible and His promise to respond. Identify any area where you've been desperate for help of God. 
find a legitimate rational for the Bible, why would God want to answer with yes and build your case before him? Never come in. See, I hope that video got your attention. See, I don't have a problem helping out family members. And I know you don't either. This family's been faithful to us in this congregation. Your mother's been diligent with her time and her talent and her tithe. She's dragged you to church many times. I don't know if you're screaming or kicking, but every time I see you, you got to smile. I want to show you right now what this your family means to this family. See, a little over a month ago, his mother, who's Allison, had a stroke and hasn't been able to work and their mortgage payments due this Friday. And I want you to see this family. See, it's one thing to help somebody out that isn't trying to help themselves, but it's another thing to be a privilege to help a single mother that has always put two pennies together and put a foot on the table and provide a good life for her son. But tonight, I'm asking for us to pay that mortgage a month's worth of groceries, which equates to 1500 And if the ushers would please come I want you to see as your mom, who couldn't even talk two weeks ago, let alone stand, is going to sing the songs with the power of Jesus. I want you to see this family respond to meet your family's need. You can write checks to the church. We're right, regardless of what you do, we're writing a check for $1,500. They're not going to suffer. Hallelujah. I want you response. Please stand and come up and give if you feel the need. Thank you, Lord. I was thanking Jesus for today. You can all stand, please. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. 
Thank you. 